Last week we talked about a few men from Cyprus and Cyrene who went to Antioch preaching the Lord Jesus. Antioch was the New York City, the Times Square of their day, center for commerce and, and, uh, and just a place for pleasure seekers, overpopulated. How did some men go into a city like that and start a revival? I don't know. But I wanted to show you what that just might look like in 2023. <laughs> going into New York City in Times Square and just preaching Jesus. And I don't know what the fruits of that were, but to see thousands of people in Times Square shouting Jesus, praising God, to me is, is wonderful. What, what might, you know, there's a lot more to that video, but they showed up in Times Square expecting God to move. And if you if I let the video keep rolling, they basically are claiming New York City back for Jesus. Staying, talking about the devil. Balaam, you have no more place in New York City. It belongs to Jesus now. They went speaking Jesus, claiming New York City back for Jesus, expecting, expecting God to move there, expecting God to take back New York City from the devil. And I just love that. I just love that. We're going to talk this morning about setting expectations. You know, I think sometimes we, we have too great of expectations for some things and not enough expectations for other things. You know, to see that many believers gathered in that place, claiming it for Jesus was encouraging. You know, the, probably the most agonizing five minutes of my entire year, every year, is New Year's Eve, five minutes before Five minutes before, the, before midnight, because Joyce makes me watch the stinking ball drop. <laughs> and, and I just can't stand it. It's so, one, it's just stupid. But, but watching, <laughs> sorry, if you like the ball, watching the culture, just watching the culture, it's like, this is, is this a picture of, of our culture? And, and it just drives me crazy. It's like, that's not the last thing I want to see before I go to bed, is this culture. But to see that culture, to see yeah. Jesus being proclaimed and, and just shouted at the, in the same spot, in the same spot, was incredibly encouraging to me. But I love that they expected God to move and do something great. If we've learned anything from our study in Acts, it's that we should expect God to move in ways that we would never expect him to. Every, at every turn, every turn from the beginning of Acts to where we are right now in chapter 12, God has been blowing their minds, absolutely blowing their minds, blowing the minds of the believers. Life was anything but mundane for the early church. Not only was everything new, everything was incredible. Everything was incredible. Listen, we need to stop underestimating what God will do and start expecting him to blow our minds with what he will do. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, praise team, for bringing the, the, those songs, that, worship, that heart of worship. And good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to have you here. We are in Acts chapter um, 12, and we're actually going to cover the whole chapter, chapter today, believe it or not. Great. It's just a great story. Well, no, no, they don't believe me. <laughs> that was not supposed to be funny. <laughs> Last week, we talked about, you know, while this revival was happening in Antioch, you know, 300 miles away, 300 miles away in Jerusalem, something else was happening. Verse 1 says, now at about that time when this revival was taking place in Antioch, Herod, the king, uh, the king stretched out his hands to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword, and because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of, past, of unleavened bread, so when he had arrested him, he put him to seize Peter also. Okay. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, keep him intending to bring him before the people after Passover. This means that it was during the Passover season. Same time that Jesus was arrested and 
put on and crucified, except this was 12 years later, 12 years after the crucifixion, the resurrection, after Pentecost, the birth of the church on, Pen on this time of Passover. The church had gone through a lot. We've been watching the church grow and expand during these 12 years. And it seems that at this time, maybe the persecution subsided a little bit. You know, they had been a church for 12 years now, and, and the believers, most of the believers had left. They fled after the death, after the uh, martyrdom of Stephen and, and Saul, the, who was really the spearhead of, of the persecution. Well, he got saved. So it seems like they're in a bit of a time where the church isn't as much of a threat. They're not being persecuted as much possibly. And they're in a famine. They're in the midst, we said last week, they were in the midst of a famine. So they had other things to worry about. But also in the midst of this famine, Herod's in charge, right? Herod's responsible for, you know, making sure the people are fed. And, and he's not doing a great job of it. Or, or maybe he is, but he needs to something. He needs to do something to appease the people, to get, to get the Jews on his side. You know, it's a lot easier to rule people when, they're, when they like you. And he, he, wants to, he wants the Jews to like him. So what do I do? Well, you know, there's that church. And they've been causing trouble, and, and we'll just, let, let's go after the church. So we go after, they take James, the apostle, and, and have him killed by the sword. Some say they cut off his head. Some say he was cut in half. It, I mean, it, either one is pretty bad, right? But this is James. If any, this is, you're probably familiar with James, James and John. James, this is James, the apostle. James the Apostle, who walked with Jesus. Remember, I mean, he was, he was close to Jesus. Peter, James, and John were the three close ones, right? It was when it was those three that Jesus often took aside. They're the ones that got to be part to witness the resurrection of the, of the young girl. And Jesus said, listen, this, don't tell anybody else about this. That's special. They got to be part of that. They, they were the ones Jesus pulled aside when he was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. And, and they got to see that. They got to see Jesus glorified and Moses and Elijah. And they were the ones that Jesus took in the garden and, and said, you guys pray for me while, while he went and agonized over in prayer with the, with the Father. There was a special intimacy between Peter, James, this James, and John. And if anybody, you would think if anybody, if you would expect anybody to be protected, right, it would be James, wouldn't it? I mean, they were close. They were, they were closer than anybody. They were cl While Jesus was on this earth, there was nobody closer to Jesus than Peter, James, and John. Expectations, right? I would expect, I would expect James to be protected from getting killed. But Jesus never promised his apostles protection, did he? Why would we expect something that has never been promised? We have a lot of expectations that Jesus never gave us. He set, his, he set expectations, but that's not one of them. He never promised his apostles. He never promised us protection from our enemies. As a matter of fact, he told us we'd face tribulation. He said, expect tribulation, expect trouble in this world, didn't he? Expect it. He said that if they, hated, if they hated you, know that they hated him first. Look what he told James and John in Matthew 20. They, were, they had different expectations. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, came with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? So we said, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one at your right hand, the other on the left, in your kingdom. But Jesus... Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. They're, they had wrong expectations, didn't they? Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? What's he talking about? He's talking about his, his suffering. He's talking about his crucifixion, his death. They said, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptized, baptism that I am being baptized baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is prepared by my Father. James was the first apostle to be martyred, the first apostle to be killed. Stephen was killed first. He was the first martyr, but he wasn't an apostle. He was a lay person. 
We don't know how John died, but we know that he suffered. Some say, you know, legend says that he was killed, he was martyred, but we, we don't know. But we know that his, he was exiled to the island of Patmos at an old age. You know, but Jesus also said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, didn't he? He said, he said you're going to drink, you know, you're going to suffer tribulation, but be of good cheer because I've overcome so we have an expectation of suffering, but we also have an expectation of, of something greater, you know, that he's overcome the world, that we should be cheerful about. See, this is the, the encouragement we have when we serve the Lord, that life is going to be tough, that we will, as believers especially, suffer in this life, but we will, you know, but be of good cheer. We have overcome. If he overcame, we overcame. We have victory. See, this life will never be good. We have, you know, this life will never be what God intended it to be, what God created it to be. He will help us get through it to the end because he overcame. We'll spend eternity with him in glory. But the best, the best we can do here is endure. Even our best days, even the best life that we could have doesn't compare to what God has prepared for us, what he prepared for us before the fall. This is not the life. This will never, ever, ever be the life God intended for us. It could never be good. It could never be wonderful. And we expect it to be, don't we? And we strive for a good life. When God said, God, it's, it'll never be what God intended it because there was a fall. And no matter how good this life is, no matter how wonderful this life is, you can never have a problem in this life, never have a sickness, just die of old age, passing away in your sleep, having all the money, all the fun, all the entertainment, all the joy that this life could possibly bring. And even that does not compare to the joy, the glory that God has prepared for us in glory. Amen. Our expectations for this life are just too high. We've set them too high. We live like we're, ex like we're owed something. We live like, God, where are you? Why, aren't you? why isn't my life better? Why do I have problems in this life? Well, he never said you wouldn't. So why do we expect him to? Expectations. Listen, you ever go to a restaurant expecting a good meal and you get a bad meal? Yeah, it stinks. You ever go somewhere expecting something bad, like this really ain't going to be that good, and it blows you away. Wow, that was great. So expectations mean something, don't they? Paul said it best in Romans 8.18. He says, for I consider that the suffering, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, or it could say to us. There's something God has prepared for us that will, that he will present to us that nothing, that no amount of suffering, even your best days here are still suffering, will compare to the glory that he's going to show us, that he's going to reveal to us. But we aren't the only ones suffering. All of creation is suffering. Think about, listen, all of creation is suffering. He goes on in, in, the same, in verse 19. I did give you that, right? 19 through 22? Oh, my bad. Romans 8. I owe you a dollar. Another dollar. <laughs> Joyce, you got any ones? It says, For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. I don't remember where I was a few weeks ago when I was riding to Arkansas on my motorcycle, but just admiring the scenery. It was just beautiful. Sometimes you just, when you're riding long trips, sometimes it's just mundane and you just, you just endure it. But sometimes you're just marveling at, at the scenery, at the sights of God's creation. As I was doing that, you know, and it was like I just started for whatever reason to notice the weeds, like growing up on the trees, choking the trees, and, and the thorns and the thistles. I'm like, why am I noticing this? Because even in the beauty of God's creation, it's, 
doesn't even compare to what, how he originally created it. Everything you see now is, is, as a, is a result of the flood, is a result of, of judgment on this earth. You go to the Grand Canyon, it's marvelous, right? I haven't been there, but I've heard it's marvelous. That is the result of God's judgment on the earth. It came as a result of the flood. We're going to Yellowstone next year. I can't wait because it's beautiful. As beautiful as Yellowstone National Park is, untouched, right? Virtually untouched by man. It doesn't even compare to God's original creation for the earth. There, it, it was totally different. The whole atmosphere was different. The sky was different. The grass was different. The trees were different. Everything that you see now, as beautiful as it is, doesn't compare to its original creation before the fall, before sin. Are you, are you tracking with me? Are you with me? After, what is it going to be like after time, when time runs out and God comes back with a new heaven and a new earth? The most beautiful place on this earth won't compare to what God has prepared for even this earth, for us to enjoy. See, our expectations, even when we go and sightsee and look at his wonderful creation, doesn't even compare to how he originally created it or what it will be like. We have great expectations for this life and this world when we should be living in expectation of what is to come. James and John wanted a seat in, the, in an earthly kingdom. They, wanted, they, they thought Jesus was going to take over, you know, over Rome and, and reclaim, and, and they wanted a seat with him. You know, and they may or may not have gotten a seat in the heavenly kingdom. That's up to the Father. But they got much more than they ever could have on this earth. James kind of got what he was asking for, wasn't he, when he was martyred, when he died? You know? And maybe, but maybe he did get a seat with, next to the Father because there is a special place for those who, who are martyred you know, for God. But Psalm 84.10 says this, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. We're living in tents of the wicked here. Rather be a one day, one day, one day, even as a doorkeeper with God, is better than a thousand here. Expectations. Why do we expect this to be so good? Living in these evil, evil tents, in these evil bodies. And God promised us so much more. I think the early church fully expected James to be released. It may happen before, right? In chapter 5, the, all the apostles were arrested. The angel comes and, sets it, and, and they have this miraculous escape. Well, this is James. This is, he, this is Jesus' buddy, his friend. Of course he's going to release Jesus. I think they fully expected that. This is James. Surely God won't let him die. Do you want me to tell you why God let James die? Do you want to know? I got your attention. I have no idea. <laughs> no idea. Wouldn't you love for me to tell you that? I don't know. Nobody knows. God knows. God knows. Could God have set him free? Absolutely. We're going to see what he does for Peter. Why did he let James die? We don't know. But what do we know? We know God is just. God is good. God is love. God's ways are higher than our ways. You know, that we do know. God never makes mistakes, but he also never promised we wouldn't suffer. So don't expect that you won't. I hate to say it, but when you serve Jesus, you may have to suffer in ways you never would have otherwise. <laughs> Life could be even harder when you serve Jesus. All right. Verse 4, so when he, they, he arrested him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, talking about Peter, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. Four squads of soldiers. So that would be about six, would be 16 soldiers. A lot of guards for one man, wasn't it? I mean, was Peter that big a guy that they, they were threatened by him? I don't know. Four squads of soldiers. Seems, seems extensive. He was chained to two soldiers. Like, wouldn't, be chained, wouldn't being chained to one be enough? Whatever the case, it was impossible. Impossible for him to escape. There's no way you're getting out of this one, Peter. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered 
to God for him by the church. Guess who woke up? (laughs) James being killed was a wake-up call that the church get back to its roots, back to prayer. You know, they say today that after 10 years, a church will start to stall out or plateau or even decline. You know, that usually a church will reach its high mark after at about 10 years. If the church makes it that long, we're talking about a healthy church. Maybe even the early church plateaued and needed a wake up call. And they're back on their knees in fervent prayer for Peter's life. Whoa, James died. Sometimes it takes something to wake us up, doesn't it? We're in the midst of a wake up call today, aren't we? The church needs to wake up, needs to realize that our greatest weapon is prayer. There was no way they were busting Peter out of prison. They did not have the power, the resources, the artillery, the weapons to bust Peter out of prison. The only way Peter was getting out of prison was prayer. Protesting, picketing outside Herod's palace would have been a complete waste of time. If only they had social media If only they had social media, they could have complained and said how bad he was, and and that would have changed everything. No. The church used its only available weapon, prayer. Prayer. Prayer is more powerful than any king, any prison, any chains. And while they're praying, what's Peter doing? Man, he's got to be all worried. I mean, he's literally going to be killed the next day. I mean, that was a promise. The only reason they, that he wasn't killed was because it was the, during the time of Passover, and it, was, it would not have uh, pleased the Jews to, to have someone executed during Passover. So verse 6 says, And when Herod was about to bring him out, the night before, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. The night before his execution, Peter sound asleep. Obviously, trusting God, trusting God, whether in death or by delivering so that he could live. It didn't matter to Peter. He, he, he was like, I'm good. I'm good. He knows his buddy was killed. What causes you to sleep at, lose sleep at night? Don't answer that. But, I mean, so many things, so many worries, so many concerns of this life. What are those things? They're things that, the things that keep you up at night are the things you're not trusting God for. Simple as that. Don't be anxious about anything, Paul says, but in everything, with prayer and petition, you know, make your request known to God. And what? The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Whatever is keeping you up at night, it's what you're not... Peter trusted God with his life, whether he loses it or whether he, he, he spares him. It didn't matter to Peter because he knew he was in God's hands. Put yourself in Peter's place, chained to two guards. You knew you're going to be killed. What would you do? Oh, I hope you and I would be able to sleep in the peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen. Can't say that I'm there either. Can't say that I'm there either. But that's the goal, isn't it? A life free from worry. Free from anxiety. Praise God. Verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourselves. And he said, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel was that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them on its own of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street. And immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Thomas Watson, the Puritan preacher, said the angel fetched Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel. I like that. We wouldn't have verses 7 through 11 without verse 5. God moves when his people pray. Listen, God moves when his people pray, meaning when his people pray, we can expect God to move. Constant in verse 5 isn't a good translation. The NIV says earnestly. The complete Jewish Bible says intensely. They prayed intense prayer was made to God. 
Some translations say fervent prayer. It wasn't, they weren't just praying constantly. They were praying fervently. They were praying intensely. You know, I get a lot of prayer requests for people I don't know at all. You know, could you pray for my second cousin out in Montana or something? You know, and, and I do. I'll pray for them and I'll mean it. And, but when it's somebody that I, I'm close to, somebody that I love and care about, and the situation is dire, guess what? I pray more fervently. I pray more intensely because it's somebody I'm close to. They were fervently praying. They were praying from the bottom of their heart with all that was in it. They were stretching themselves out in prayer for Peter. You know, I mean, this was a dire situation, and they're praying with all earnestness of heart, not just constantly. You know, we're in a place where intense, fervent prayer is needed for our loved ones, for our that don't know the Lord, for for people, for lost souls. You know, time is running out. Time is short. There is a battle taking place for the souls of people, your loved ones, your children, maybe your parents, you know, your grandchildren. They need intense, fervent prayer, expectant prayer, expecting that if we pray earnestly, God will save them. God will reach them. God will find a way to get to their hearts. Church, we need to pray expecting that God is going to save our children. God is going to save our family members, our loved ones. It's time to pray fervently and expect God to do the miraculous. Salvation is a miracle, church. We, begin, we need to pray for God to do the miraculous. The angel miraculously frees Peter. Listen, Peter wasn't given supernatural strength to break the chains. He, you know, he, he had barged through the iron gates. He didn't even know what was going on. He didn't even know he was awake. He thought he was dreaming. The angel had to even help him dress. <laughs> Put your garments on, silly. We're getting out of here. Get dressed. I mean, he's, he's doing everything for him. 16 guards around him, two changed to him, more at the guard post, an iron gate. And I love that it simply opened on its own accord. He didn't even have to open the gate. He didn't have to pick the lock or steal the keys. The gate literally opened by itself. How hard was this for the angel? What was impossible for Peter? Simply praying earnestly, a group of people praying, God sent an angel, and the angel did it all. Can we learn anything from that? Yeah. All the effort. We have to do something, right? We're always talking. We have to do something. We're fixers. Men, we're fixers. We always want to fix things. But the last thing we want to do is get down on our knees in fervent prayer. We try to fix everything first. And it's so easy when we just expect to, when we pray and expect God to answer our prayers. It's just so easy. The gates open by themselves. Chains just fall off. Just simply expecting God to move. Ephesians 6.18, you know, these are the armor of God scriptures. You know, put on the armor of God, the spirit of truth, the, you know, the, the, all, all, the, all those things. But look what he says. He says, praying always. This is part of the armor. Praying always and with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. Praying, always praying, praying always. Prayer will always work, church. We can't and we won't win the spiritual battle. And guess what? It's all a spiritual battle. It's all a spiritual battle for souls, for, for, the, for your life. The devil is trying to steal your soul. He's trying to keep the souls of those that don't know him. It's all a spiritual battle. And we cannot and will not win the spiritual battle without prayer. Earnest prayer. Verse 12, so when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where the, many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. And they weren't even that concerned about that. Now Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent. Like, 
I just got out, right? They don't want to let them know where they're at. He's at. He declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison and said, go tell these things to James and the brethren. That would be James, the brother of Jesus, half brother of Jesus. And he departed and went to another place. Pretty comedic story, isn't it? I mean, I'm assuming this young Rhoda was a young girl and she gets all excited and they don't even believe her. And they say it's an angel and they're like, you know, leave us alone. We're praying for Peter's release, right? Or they're praying. Isn't the church a fickle bunch? I mean, I think they took it for granted that James would be released somehow, some way. But when that didn't happen and James was killed, I think they lost some faith. I think they lost a little faith. You know, they assumed God was going to, God love. this is James. This is, James is dead. God, there's no way God's not going to release James. And when he was killed, I think that, I think it burst their faith a little bit. I think they lost a little bit. They earnestly prayed for Peter, but didn't expect him to be freed. You know, this was a big ask. You know, the security was increased, the chains, the gates, you know, Pete, they lost James. We pray for some pretty big things sometimes, don't we? You know, if you come on a Tuesday, we pray for, you know, the world. We pray for um, Ukraine. Lord, peace in Ukraine. And, and we pray for Israel. Lord, peace in Israel. Salvation for the Israelites. Salvation for, save Hamas. Save the Hamas soldiers, right? That's a big ass, isn't it? I mean, do you really believe that could happen? Really? Hamas and Israel are going to be united in Jesus, we believe it could happen. And guess what? It will someday. It will someday. For those, many will believe. We pray for, pray for Pastor Andrew. You know, he's, we pray earnestly for Pastor Andrew and what he's going through. And, and, and we, you know, try to pray believing. But, but part of us is like, man, I don't know. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, deep down inside, you know, it's been going on. Is it, is it possible? You know, we, we tend to have doubts. You know, James died. James died. Sometimes God doesn't answer prayer the way we expect him to. So, so we lose a little bit of faith. Why do we lose faith? We have faith that God will do it or can do it, but it's a weak faith when it comes to the big things. We underestimate what God can do when we pray with faith. Mark 11 so now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the, root, from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Surprised. Jesus cursed it. Why are you so surprised, Peter? <laughs> so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. Whatever things. He's using a mountain, right? A mountain, praying that a mountain would be removed. And th is, that's a big ask. It's kind of silly, isn't it? But it's a big ask. But if you believe it, God is using that as an analogy. Whatever you pray in his name, if it's according to God's will, believe it. I mean, if Jesus prayed it, why are you surprised, Peter? You know, everything that Jesus prayed, we could expect to happen. That's why I love Jesus' prayers. Why I love John 17, because it's going to happen. It wouldn't, he wouldn't pray it if, if it wasn't going to happen. So Jesus tells us that when we pray, we should believe we have already received what we have asked for. So the question is, how do you believe at that level? How do we get to that place? Are you already there? Let's be honest. How do we get to that level where whatever we pray, we can believe that it's, we've already received it? Do we try harder? No, because the harder we try, it just shows the more we don't believe, right? The less you really believe. Belief comes from a deep deep-rooted understanding in your spirit that it's true. You just know. You just know that it's true. Has, have you ever prayed a prayer like that where you just knew? You know, we were talking about Andrew, and, and, and I said, you know, when I, I remember praying for Pastor Parente. He was diagnosed. He was given a year to live, a year to live, and I prayed for him, and I just knew. 
It's like God in my spirit, deep rooted within my spirit, I knew that he was going to be healed. That was 25 or so years ago. He's still alive and kicking. He, God healed. I just knew. I'm not saying it was my prayer that healed him. I don't know. A lot of people were praying for him, but I just had a knowing, deep rooted that, yeah, I was just, I didn't even, I stopped praying for him and just started thanking God because I knew. That's what he's talking about. Just knowing deep within your spirit that you know. To pray believing take, that you've received, it takes time to think as, and see things as Jesus thinks and sees. It's having the mind of Christ. It com- true belief comes from knowing the truth. Where's the truth? God's word is truth. And to know God's word at the level that Jesus knows God's word. Listen, to know God's word at the level that Jesus, not the level that I know God's word. Listen, I, if all you're getting, if the only truth you're getting is what you hear from me, that's knowing truth as I, at my level. Listen, that's not going to be enough. That's not mountain-moving faith. That's not mountain-moving truth. Knowing it as Jesus through the Spirit, right? Reading the Bible. We've been talking about reading the Word. Let the Spirit teach you. Let the Spirit teach you, and you can have the mind of Christ. You be, can begin to know truth as Jesus knows truth. And to know God's word at the level that Jesus knows God's word requires renewing of your mind and the transforming of your mind into the image of Christ's mind. That's what he does. That's what the Holy Spirit does when we seek truth, when we read the Bible for ourselves. Listen, there's going to be times when we just can't get there and we pray like, remember the father of the epileptic son? I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. I, you know how many times I think I say that? I believe, but I kind of don't help that unbelief in me. And what did God do? That was enough, wasn't it? That was enough faith for that healing. That was enough faith for God. You know, he said he took that little bit of faith. But I don't think the next time that father came to Jesus, he was expecting that same level of faith, that his faith should have grown from that. Look, I did this with the measure of faith. Now, now grow your faith, strengthen your faith. You've seen what I can do. Listen, that's good. There will be times, you know, that faith was enough for God to act. However, to, the belief to move a mountain takes more than just the limited belief the father had for his sons. It takes seeing from Jesus's perspective. You know, seeing un, has, as Jesus seeing, sees and therefore believing as Jesus believes. The Bible's fascinating. It's fascinating. You can study it your whole life. And, and the more you dig in, the, the deeper it gets. You know, and, and there's just so much into it, so much in it that, that we'll, ne- we'll never uncover all the symbolism, all the truths of the Bible. You know, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about learning all about the theology of the Bible. It's a supernatural book. But at the heart of the Bible, the heart of the Bible is really that it's just a love letter from a father to the children. Everything you learn in the Bible, no matter how deep it is, how how deep the symbolism and the poetry and everything is, all it's doing is trying to show you how much he loves you and how to love him in return. And when you understand that, that church, that is when you begin to see things like Jesus sees them. It's not about reading the Bible. That's why I'm always saying read the Bible to, to learn about Jesus, because to, le- to know him is to, is to love him. And when you know that he loves you, you know that he cares for you and that he's going to answer your prayers. How, listen, if your child asks you for something, what's the Bible say? How much? I think I gave you the scripture, Matthew. Jesus said himself, Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, do not work Nope, that's not the right one. Six, if then you, if then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven get good, good gifts to those things, to those who ask Him? If you are going, listen, when you know that your Father loves you, you pray expecting Him to, to answer because He cares for you, because He loves you. So that whatever the answer is, whatever the answer is, you know that he's answering it out of love. He's doing what's best for you. You see, that's where faith comes to you. Do you know that God loves you? See, James died. James got killed. 
Things happen in life because our expectations on this life are too high. And, 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 and you know what? I lost my job. God must not care about me. Or, or so-and-so passed away. God must, where's God in all this? And we begin to think that God doesn't care, that God doesn't love, that God's not concerned about your needs. And we begin to pray from that area. That's where our faith comes from. Our expectations are too low. That Not that God can do it, but that God cares enough to do it that God's paying attention, that he cares about the little things in your life, that he cares about the big things in your life. I believe that's where they were. James died. Whoa. Has God stopped caring? Are we doing something wrong? Has sin sin come into the church? What's going on? Why did God stop caring? Is God mad at me? And and he doesn't, he's not going to answer, and and our faith takes a hit, and, and guess what? We're not moving mountains anymore. Everything was great for the early church until Stephen was killed. Then persecution came and things weren't so good anymore, were they? Everything was great. The church was growing. Everyone had all things. It was a wonderful time to be a Christian until it wasn't. Did God stop caring? All, did God stop? Now, people, now we're being forced from our homes. Did God stop caring? Does God not love us anymore? You know, we begin to doubt and question God's care, question ourselves. What did we do? Life is hard, and our expectations of this life are too high. When we doubt our prayers will be answered because we doubt God cares enough to answer them. God's love never changes. He didn't love James any less than he loved Peter. He didn't. You know, God doesn't view death like we do. God doesn't view suffering like we do. He uses it, right? God doesn't, I mean, we, 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 yes, we get upset. We hurt when people die. We, we don't understand when these things happen. How could you take so-and-so from me? That's not how God views death. You know, God sees, God sees death as, as an end to this and, to, and the beginning of something great, something new with him. You know, we are left here to suffer and to grieve, but God, they, God gets to rejoice with that one who is, who is with him in paradise. James, I'm sure the moment James' head started rolling, he didn't care about this life anymore. He was with Jesus, and Jesus was with him. That's what it's always been about. You know, he doesn't view suffering as we do. How could you let me suffer like this? What does the Bible say? It's for the perfecting of your rejoice. Rejoice in your suffering. It's in the perfecting of your faith. Why? Why? So we, so we are perfected. We will make it through so we will be with him one day. That we don't get sidetracked along the way. That we don't turn from our faith. God views suffering different than we suffer. View suffer excuse me, view suffering God didn't take Enoch and Elijah out of this world because he didn't love them. No, he spared them from this world, didn't he? You guys are doing so good. Just come be with me. Just come. You've suffered enough. You know, somebody gets taken from this world and and we're just, oh, we question God. We begin to doubt God. We deny God's love. How could you let this happen? How could you let this happen? Because our expectations are too high for this life. Peter rested in God's love, whether he lived or died. He'd later write in 1 Peter 3.12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I always say, pray for your enemies, because when you give up your anger and your unforgiveness, you're turning them over to God. Pray for your enemies because now they're in God's hands. Listen, as long as you're holding on to bitterness, holding on to anger, holding, you know, well, they're not in God's hands. They're in your hands still. God can't move because what if he does? What if he, what if he goes, you know, takes that per- person out because, because of your anger and your bitterness? What does that do for you? Nothing. But when you give it to God, put them in God's hands, well, now God's free to do with them whatever he wants. Don't mess with God's children. Don't mess with God's children. You know, let's see what happens when you do. Verse 18, then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers. Could you imagine about what had become of Peter? But when Herod had searched for them and not found them, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea and Caesarea and stayed there 
it wasn't the guards' fault. They were just doing their job. They're doing what they were told. How do you stop an angel? I mean, what were they supposed to do? They didn't do anything wrong. But they were not under God's protection. We're not told, but at least it's at least possible that they recognize this as supernatural. You know, we'll see that in later with um, Paul and Silas and the, and, the, and the guard, right? It's at least possible that, that maybe some of them got saved, you know, that they saw this as, my goodness, maybe their God is real. Maybe what they're talking about is real. It's very possible, but we don't know that. But we do know that they were just on the wrong side. They were on the wrong side, you know. We don't know when we're going to die. We don't know when we're going to die. Better just to trust them today. You know, they died. They died. They, they didn't do anything wrong, but they died. They, they weren't under God's protection. They were not children of God. Even if they were, if they were, if they did get saved, you know, well, they still died, but they went to be with the Lord. We don't know when our day will come. You know, is God just? Yes, he is. Is he fair? Yes, he is. Is he, is, does he love? Yes, he does. So, Hopefully, some of them gave their heart to the Lord. If not, it's too late for them. You know? But look what happened to Herod. This is what I want you to see. Now, Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, having made Blastus, the king's personal aide, their friend. So they asked for peace because their country was supplied with, the, with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an or- oration to them. And the people kept shouting, the voice of God is not and not of a man. Then immediately the, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. We don't know why they were mad at Herod, but it was a famine and they were dependent on Herod for fr- food. So they made friends with Blastus and to arrange for this meeting. And Herod shows up in his royal apparel and sits on his throne. Now, it seems, you know like an unnecessary detail, but it sets the stage for what Herod thought of himself, you know, in his royal apparel. Jewish historian Josephus tells us that Herod's royal robes were actually made of pure silver threads, you know. It was, I'm sure it was the best of the best. I mean, it shows you what Herod thought of himself, right? Of course, John, of course, and in need of his food, in need of his bread, the people butter him, butter him, him up, shouting, you're a god, not a man. I like what John Corson said. He said, flattery is like bubble gum. You can enjoy it for a moment, but don't swallow it. <laughs> More often than not, when someone flatters you, he's attempting to get something from you, which is exactly what's happening here. I don't believe the only reason Herod was struck down was because he didn't give God the glory. Yeah, that was the nail that, you know, the, the, you know in the co- final nail in the coffin. But people take credit for what God does all the time, even today, right? And they don't die. Yeah, I saw an oil painting of a former president recently at the, at the South Carolina State Fair. Really nice oil painting. It was selling for $22,000. I said, there's only one person in the world that would buy that painting, and it's the one whose picture is on that painting, because I know that's what he thinks of himself. No, God gave Herod time to change his heart. This was evidence that he didn't. This was evidence that he didn't, and God took him out. He messed with God's children, and he still had time. He still had time to repent, to change his heart, and and he didn't. And God said, that's it. That's it. And he took him out. Don't mess with God's children. Romans 12, 19 through 21 Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not become overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. The world is evil. We have to do something. We have to do something. What do we do? There's the formula right there, isn't it? Do good. God's got your back. 
Expect God to do something. Listen, the world is coming against the church, isn't it? What do we do? He just told us what to do. To do good, feed them, right? Love them, you know, pray for them. Do good to them. And in doing so, God's got your back. If we don't, if we take matters into our own hands, we don't overcome anything and we don't turn them over to the one who can. God knows the world is evil. It's not a surprise to God. He overcame the world by what? Doing good, by giving himself. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Re- know the truth of God's Word. Know, have the mind of Christ, and you'll be able to... What does good look like? I don't know. Look, do, do what Jesus would do. Do what Jesus would do. He gave himself. He, he, he let himself die. While yet we were still evil, while yet we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what do you do? Die to yourself. Die to yourself. If it costs you your life, give up your life. Just like James. And overcome, we overcome the evil in this world by doing good. If we keep expecting to do, but that by doing the same things we're doing and we're expecting different results, that's just insanity, isn't it? By definition, that's insanity. Maybe we should expect God to do something when we, the people of God, get on our knees and fervently pray and ask Him to. I know you don't want to hear that because we all want to do something. We feel like we got to do something. Pray. It's the greatest weapon you'll, you can ever have, the greatest weapon you will ever wield. But the word of the Lord grew and multiplied because God's people prayed. Because God's people prayed. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. That's the word. That's the word for tonight. A little different. I don't know that I've heard a teaching quite like that, but God just laid on my heart that, that, that we're expecting too much, expecting too much out of this life and not expecting enough out of him. You know, we need to reverse that. Expect less from this world. We've never been promised anything in this world. Expect more from him. Whether that, and expect more that when we suffer, he's doing something good. Expect that when a loved one dies, God had a, plan, a, a greater plan and a purpose for them. Expect that God loves you and cares about you, that whatever you ask, he's going to give you the best answer to your prayer because we don't even know what to pray for most of the time. Expect God to move. Amen. Praise God. How do we become children of God? How do we tap into the, to, to the love of our Father? Listen, He loves all of us, no matter what, what. He loved us when we were yet still sinners. He demonstrated His love to us by sending His Son into this world to die for us. He loves us no matter what. How do we, but we, before, but we only fall under the, the blessing of that love, under the spigot of that love, if you want, under the, you know, where that love is being poured out when we are in Jesus. When we receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we tap into the blessings of God. But you have to, outside of that, we're, we're living in darkness. We're living in, in sin. We're, we're lost. But he, he came and he died. And the blood that he shed on Calvary, on the cross, is, is sufficient because he lived a perfect life and died a perfect death and rose again on the third day by simply believing that his blood is sufficient to cover our sins, the death of one man, the blood of one man, his, that supernatural life, that wonderful love is sufficient to cleanse us from every sin we ever committed, every sin we ever will commit. And the fact that he rose from the dead on the third day proves to us that it worked. You just have to believe that. You have to believe that with all of your heart and you will be saved. We confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord. Believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. We will be saved. We will begin, we will become children of God. Guess what? 
When you're a child of God, your life is in His hands, and there's no better, more capable hands than His hands. But you have to receive Him as your personal Lord and Savior. And if He has spoken to your heart, if the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart this morning, and you want to say, yes, Pastor Jim, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, we just help you do that by, by acknowledging it. Yes, raising your hand, say, yes, Pastor, I want to receive Jesus. I'll, we will say a prayer with you, ex- receiving what you've already received in your heart. But God does ask that we be bold in front of men and women and, and, and verbally say that, verbally say, yes, yes, Pastor Jim, I want to receive that. We'll be happy for you. We'll say the prayer with you because we've all done that. But we would ask that you raise your hand. If God's spoken to your heart and you want to become a child of God today, listen, there's no greater, you'll never have a greater opportunity than you will to become a child of God. Nothing in this world can, has, has a greater is greater than becoming a child of God. Salvation is a gift. It's a free gift. Anybody want to receive that gift this morning? Would you raise your hand? Okay. I don't see any hands, so I'm going to trust and believe that. We've all done that, and I'm glad that you have. I'm glad that you have. So let's just pray. A little different word this morning, but I, I hope, you know, ex- we talk about perception a lot, you know, how we perceive things. Well, how we ex- our expectations are important. You know, once we begin to lower our expectations on what this life has to offer and begin to live in the expectation of what God has for us, what God has prepared for those who love him, man, this life becomes so much easier. <laughs> it really, really does. Through the trials, through the suffering, it, it comes easier. So, Lord, I do thank you. I thank you that you didn't, you never sugarcoated your word. Lord, I feel, I, I feel sorry for those people who, who go to places where, where they're told if they just receive Jesus, everything will be okay, that their life will be good. You never promised that, so I, I don't know why we ex- ever expected that. We have too great expectations on, on this life and, and not enough, not enough on, what, on, on your love, on what you'll do for us. So, Father, I just pray that, that we would adjust our expectations on this life, begin to live with, in the light of eternity, in the light of what you prepared for us, that, that we're going to suffer in this world. that But Lord, you left us here for a reason. You left us here to share your love, to share your expectations with others. Lord, it's worth it. It's worth the suffering. It's worth the pain, getting to know you, knowing knowing that one day we'll be in glory for forever and ever and ever. That's enough for me. Lord, may we live lives that, that, that exhibit our expectation of our future. Lord, burn that in our spirit. Burn in our spirit that when we pray, we know that what we ask, that we have the mind of Christ, that we even know what to pray for, and that when we don't know what to pray for, sometimes we can just groan. <laughs> we just pray, but your spirit picks up our prayers because the spirit of God knows exactly what to pray for. May we tap into the greatest weapon, the greatest tool we ever will wield on this, in this life and pray. We pray for our community. We pray for Dagsboro, expecting, expecting our town, expecting those children we minister to, expecting their parents to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We expect revival in Dagsboro, in all of Sussex County. Lord, it's not too great an ass. We expect this church to be filled. We expect high tide. They open their new building with, with the expectation that that building will be filled for the glory of God. Bless them, we pray, Lord, as they've been faithful. They've been faithful wherever you put them, in the schools, in the firehouse halls, wherever they've met, they've been faithful. Now, we expect them to be filled as they open our new building today and dedicate that building to you. That's just the building, Lord. It's the people there that make up the church. We, we pray that that church will be used to bring many souls to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Father, bless us, we pray, as we go our separate ways today, that we'd go out expecting great things, expecting to be our, have our minds blown by the things that you do, that we come back testifying next week. You won't believe what God did, <laughs> but we'll believe it because we know our God. Hallelujah. Blow our minds, Lord. Blow our minds like you did in the early church. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, hallelujah.